Let's take our Bibles and turn, if you would please, to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms and chapter 139. Psalm 139. It's a great chapter, and we've been in it recently. But uh, I had a thought. In fact, I, there's a, I, love, I love how God works. I got in the mail yesterday. I forgot to check mail the day before, and so I, um, and I realized, oh, I, oh I, I didn't check the mail in the morning, so late last night, um, I think it was last night or the night before. Anyway, whenever it was, it was late at night and I had not checked the mail all day. And in the mailbox was a package. It was a CD. And I thought, I know that name. There's a, there's a lady named Marlena Whitworth. I thought, I know that name. And uh, so I opened it up. There's a letter. There's a CD and there's a letter. And she's apologizing for forgetting something. But we had a visitor Oh, a year or two ago, I don't know, I don't, it's been a while, but I don't, it doesn't matter to me how long, and she didn't need to apologize, but it was her, um, her uh, good spirit that I guess caused her to, but anyway, uh, she's a really decent, uh, godly young lady, and I remember her from Bible college, her, her, she had a different name, her maiden name was different, but anyway, she, she was a great singer, she had a good singer, I loved, used to love to see her coming up and to sing specials in church, and she had a great voice, and, uh, and she could get high notes, and she could sing to make, you know, goosebumps come up your back and, and neck and so forth, and I so enjoyed it. And she married a young man, and he's a pastor of a church, and so they've been pastoring, and uh, she's been a, a wife to pastor for many, many years. And, and, uh, and the CD, of course, was a blessing to me, but it's a blessing that she would, a lady from, her, from their church was visiting here, and found out that I was a Hiles Anderson graduate. So she asked, did you know so-and-so? Because our pastor's a Hiles Anderson graduate. And anyway, long, to make a long story short, she said, I'm going to tell her about it. She really enjoyed the services here. And so she went back home and, and, uh, and told them and said, and so, uh, so, so this pastor's wife sent me a CD. She said, I found your note some remote place. I don't know how it got there, but I found your note. I felt sorry about the delay, but I remember the lady telling about going to your church. And so... I thought I'd send you as a gift one of my CDs I made. And, of course, I've been enjoying it. But anyway, but one of the songs that she sang on that CD prompted me to think of this passage. And so I want to share a message that was born out of, well, from the Word of God, obviously, but born from the emotion of, 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 of nostalgia as well as scriptures that show a wonderful truth. So I want to share something with you and I. Um, I'm going to have to work hard at being short because this this is so. There's so many things, and, and I hope that I hope that if I don't bring up something that relates to you, that you will translate and that you will get a blessing out of this. But Psalm 139, we're going to start with verse one. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me; Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising; Thou understandest my thought afar off; Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Now watch these next few verses. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me because of God's presence. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. And I'll stop there, but I'm going to, I'm just going to give you the title, and, and then I hope you can translate. I'll make a few illustrations here, but 
but she was singing a song, and I don't remember the title now because it's all new to me, so I, I don't remember it, but, but uh, I, ch- I made a change to it. And uh, because I had this thought while listening to one of her songs, this thought hit me. You can never, this passage hit me, you can never go where God has never been. There's a particular place that I'm going to emphasize, but you can never go where God has never been. Which means you can never go through anything that God cannot understand, and He hasn't been through similar. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are. So you can never go. So I just want to say this. This is sort of a pastoral encouraging message to you and hope that you'll be inspired from scriptures that the breath of God will breathe into you hope and, and, and faith and courage and whatever it is that you need when you go through or you're going through a time or you're, you're in a situation that you think, oh, nobody understands. Oh, there's one who does. Because you can never go where God has never been. David said here in this psalm, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, the deepest, drown, or whatever, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. He says, Whither shall I flee from, the, from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Well, that, duh, obviously. <laughs> but wait a minute, what about the next one? If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. And that's the thought that really struck me that I want to emphasize a little bit. And I'm not going to teach any new doctrine. I'm going to remind you one that I teach quite often. (laughs) Sometimes I feel like I do it too much, but I don't think you can do it too much. Because what Jesus suffered should never be taken for granted. You can never talk about it enough. So, uh, whatever you're going through in life, I hope this message will help you. You can never go anywhere where God has not been. You can't go through anything but what he does not understand. And I'm going to throw something else in there into the mix right now. (coughs) Keep in mind, God created you. He knows everything about your body. He knows what every chemical, every gland in your body, different chemical, every gland in your body can secrete that can cause you to feel or think a certain way. And God also created every nerve ending that you have including all the neurons in your brain. So there's nothing you can imagine, nothing you can think. God knows all your thoughts, and He understands you from afar off. God's not way up in heaven and and so remote that He doesn't understand you. God understands you from afar off, and you can never go where He's never been. He's already been there. Let me give you a a perfect example of this. I'm just going to save time. Instead of doing a bunch of other illustrations I was going to do, I'm going to save time and go to the worst-case scenario. Hell. <laughs> well, I'm going to hell because I don't like all these Christians. I want to go to hell. I've heard people say, I'm, go- I'm going to hell where all my buddies are. Besides, I, I can't stand this idea of God. So if there's a hell, I want to go there because I don't want to spend eternity with a God who would even create a hell. I've heard people say stuff like that. Well, guess what? What they need to understand is they can never go where God's never been. So turn to me to Psalms chapter 16. You're familiar with that. I'm sure those that come here regularly. And... Uh, um, and I'll show you something amazing. I, I'll never get over it. And on purpose, I don't want to ever get over it. Psalms chapter 16. Verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. This is a psalm of David, but David's not talking about himself here. Why? Because David didn't always set the Lord before him. There's times when he, he put God in the back, background so he could go do what he wanted to do. I'm sure David didn't have the Lord before him when he looked out the window and saw Bathsheba and then schemed and planned, I'm the king, I can give orders. And he sent for her to come to the... I'm, I'm sure David not, did not have the Lord before him at that time. So David's not talking about them. Whoever talk, this is not David talking about himself. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing down a conversation between Jesus Christ and God the Father. The Lord Jesus is the only one that can say, I have set the Lord always before me when he was on earth. He, and even, even in heaven. 
Okay, I've set the Lord up. Why? God is always before himself. God is always aware of himself. Are you self-aware? Sometimes you are, sometimes you're not. God is always self-aware. He's eternal. And so he said, I have always, I have set the Lord always before me. This is Jesus talking, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. I've came to earth, I'm going to go to earth for a certain purpose, and no one and nothing is going to move me from it. Remember the crowd that, that came and, and boy, they, they, they kind of corralled Jesus and were moving him up to the brow of a cliff, and they wanted to cast him over the cliff. But that's not what Jesus came to. He didn't come to die by being thrown over a cliff. He came to die on the cross to shed his blood for our sins, according to the scriptures. And so when he got to the brink of the flesh, he turned, uh, br brink of the cliff, he turned, and I don't know, but the Bible says he passed through the midst of them. He used his power somehow and his intimidation power by boring his eyes in that first person. That guy, oh boy, he's coming after me. He backed up and then the next guy, oh, I'm not going to face him either. Let somebody else do it. And he passed right through the midst of them. Why? It was not God's will. He was going to go to Calvary and nothing was going to move him from it. When he went to, to Gethsemane shortly before, he was crying out, God, look, Father, if it be possible. But it wasn't possible. But he showed the anguish of heart like we all have. He showed his emotion. He showed his longings and desires. And, and, and notice, you've got desires that are inner desires and you've got surface desires. See, sometimes, like, I want to go to church. I look forward to going to church, but sometimes on Sunday morning, I don't want to get up. <laughs> all right? You understand that one, don't you? All right? So you've got two sets of desires. You've got your deep, deep set desires. Those desires of your heart, your soul, and then you, you've got fleshly desires. You got the desires of the new of the new man, you got the desires of the old man. You've got the desires of the spirit. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so Jesus expressed that, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. See? But he would not be moved. I shall not be moved. And he sweat as it were great drops of blood. He's in such anguish in that garden. But he, he said, I'm going through with it, Lord. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be obedient unto you, even unto death. So this is talking about the Lord Jesus. In verse 9, he says, therefore, my heart is glad. His heart is glad. You think Jesus is going to Calvary? You think Jesus went down the road to Calvary? Bearing the, hey, hey, all right. Hey, everybody. Guess what? I'm going to be suffering for you soon. No, no, no. Why? His flesh was in sorrow. He knew. Keep in mind. This is, the, this is the one, he's the one who designed the body. He's the one that designed the nerve endings. He's the one that knew every single nerve before it happened, before the thrones pierced his brow, he knew what it would feel like. You, ever, you just try it? No, don't try it. But <laughs> imagine, imagine watching someone smash their thumb and hearing them yell and they said, you know, I want to try that. <laughs> or if you've ever accidentally... Smash your thumb. Imagine doing it on purpose after having known what it feels like. Hey, well, that really hurts. I'm going to do the other one. <laughs> That's about as close as I can compare to, to realizing the, the, the amazingness that God, that Jesus was not moved and that he was glad, but inwardly. His heart was glad. But he wasn't going up that road to Calvary. Hoo-hoo, I'm going to die for your sins. No. He had, he had the flesh, too, that didn't want to have to do that. But he had to. He knew it. See, we're made in God's image. See? So even God, at times, there's many times in the Bible, the Bible says, it repented the Lord. For example, Genesis chapter 6. It repented the Lord that he made. The Lord said, it repented me that I have made man. Does that mean God changed his mind? No, it's a temporary feeling of wishing he had not made man, but deep down, no. He already had the plan of salvation. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But he shows, God shows that he's, he's two-sided in a sense. He's got two levels. And just like we do as, as God's children, we've got the spiritual desires, your desire to, oh, I want to read the Bible. But then your flesh says, I'm too tired. I, I don't want to read the Bible. And you go to bed without doing so. You know what I'm talking about. 
See? God goes through the same thing. He just doesn't do it. He just doesn't do wrong like we do. He just doesn't fail. So, he says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. We put rest and peace on people's graves. Jesus could have just had rest and hope on his. Now, here's why he's going to rest in hope. For thou, or because, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to seek corruption. And this is not new to you, so, but, but for the sake of those that may listen for the first time on, on the internet or wherever, let me just say again, Jesus, this is Jesus talking about how he is going to come to earth and die for our sins, not just physically, because there's two deaths, remember? The wages of sin is death, but there's a second death, which implies that there's a first death. The first death is when the body dies. The second death is when the soul goes to hell, or the lake of fire is called the second death. Now, if the wages of sin is death, and by the way, the word death in the Greek, not that I care much about Greek or Hebrew anymore, but, but it's a plural word. So it means both. The wages of sin. And by the way, it's pictured in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, on the Day of uh, Atonement, the priest was supposed to take two goats. And one was called the Lord's goat, and the other was called the scapegoat. And the Lord's goat, they would take a knife and cut its throat and offer that as a blood sacrifice. That represented the physical death. And then the other goat, goat was called the scapegoat, and the priest was supposed to lay hands on the head of that goat and confess all the sins of the congregation of Israel for the last year on the head of that goat. In other words, put the blame on that goat. That's why he's called a scapegoat. You know, scapegoat is someone who takes the blame of others. And so that comes from Scripture. Um, and so the priest would lay his hands and confess the sins of all the congregation of Israel on the head of that goat, and then he'd take that goat and send that goat out be led by the hand of a strong man into the wilderness where there's no home, endless wandering. That is a picture of hell. Being cast out, separated from God, eternity, no home, wandering, or constantly falling in a bottomless pit, or whatever, a lake of fire, tumbling in a lake of fire. And it, it, that picture is the second death. That picture is the eternal death. That picture is saying Jesus and the, and the Old Testament sacrifice pictured what Jesus is going to suffer. So when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die physically. It was just not just the blood from his, from his head and all over his body from the cat of nine tails and the nail prints and, the, and, and his hands and his feet. That's just the physical part. Jesus, according to this scripture, went to hell. His soul went to hell. Because he says to the Father, I'm, my glory rejoiceth. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Ladies and gentlemen, it is impossible. It is impossible to leave something somewhere without putting it there first. Now I'm off camera. You can't leave something somewhere without putting it there. So you see, Jesus said to the Father, I'm going to go to earth. And this is written 900 years before he even came to earth. Proof that Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world and that God's not governed by time like we are. And Jesus showed us through this prophecy to David that he was going to die for our sins and suffer hell for us as well. Dip his soul into hell and suffer an eternity's worth of hell so he could pay not the half price but the full price of sin. So, Folks, let me tell you something. There's no place you can go but what he's, he's already been. He's been to hell. And there's nobody that's going to go to hell and say, Lord, this ain't right. You, you're supposed to be a God of love. God says, I've already been there. And you wouldn't have to go there if you had believed that I'd been there. If you had trusted my payment. But you rejected my payment. Even though I suffered for your sins, I could not account my suffering towards your account because you rejected me. So, but anyway, I, I don't want to lay, belabor that right now so much as I just want to encourage and let you know there's no place that you can go but what he has not already been. And that includes hell. And hopefully no, no one in this room will ever go to hell. But boy, if you do, it'll be because you rejected the Lord or you 
satisfied yourself with your own good works or you thought you're, you're good enough, surely God will let you in heaven. No, 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 no one's good. We're all sinners. There's none righteous. No, not one. And what righteousness we think we have? Uh-uh. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And there's none good. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. So Jesus, if he could go suffer hell for us, don't you think he'll go through your trials? Don't you think he'll go through and stand by you and be help, a help to you and lead you and guide you no matter what you're going through? Yes, he will. I don't care if you're even backslidden and you're in a tavern or you're in a, a whorehouse or, or you're in a, 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 a back alley doing drugs or, or you're in a, 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 a saloon and, 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 and you've got something terrible in your life that's happening. You want to drown yourself in, 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 the, in, in, in the evil spirits. Huh. I don't care how backslidden you get. If you know the Lord is your Savior, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And no matter where you go, you, you'll never go where he's ne not been. What a savior, what a friend, what a guide. Why, he has to go. Number one, it's impossible not to go anywhere. He's omnipresent. But number two, if you ever went in a real bad place, you could never get out if he wasn't there to lead you. So there's no place you can go. Because no matter what happens, no matter, no matter what situation you get in life, God is there with you if you know him as savior. And he's there to lead you out whenever you're ready. But you have to decide, I'm going to follow him now. I got here, I got in this trouble because I stopped following him or I wasn't following him like I should. But I believe his promise. He's here and you just cry out to him, oh Lord, I'm sorry I got this mess. But Lord, at least I know you're here with me and now help lead me out. I'm ready to go. Like Jonah in the whale. What the Bible says, he fled from the presence of the Lord. Chapter 1. In chapter 2. He's in the belt, whale, whale's belly, and he cries out to the Lord. Why? Because God was with him in the whale's belly. In the depths of the sea, where he said he could see the, the foundation of the mountains or the bottom of the mountains or whatever. Uh, he could, uh, he was, uh, uh, couldn't see, but anyway, it's pretty dark inside a whale's belly in the bottom of the ocean. You know, it can't get any darker than that. But, uh, but anyway, boy... But there he called out to the Lord. Why? He knew God's promises, that God was with him. You know, one of the things we, like the song says, oh, what needless pain we uh, bear and so forth, um, is because we forget that God's with us. We get in a bad situation, or some, sometimes it's because of our doing, sometimes it's because of the doings of somebody else who's evil or wicked or careless or whatever, and we get in a bad situation, could be a financial situation, could be a physical situation, could be a, a, a spiritual situation, but a family situation, but we're in a bad place, in a bad, and we, we wish we weren't there, but we can't do anything about it, except you can acknowledge God's there too. He's there. You can never go where he has not already been. So, welcome him. Another good example is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> they got thrown into a fiery furnace. But guess what? Guess who was there with them? <laughs> oh, oh, Nebuchadnezzar said, did, we not throw, did not we throw three men into the fire? And they said, yay. He says, well, I see four. And the fourth is likened to the Son of God. Oh, of course, because Jesus, you can never go where he's not already been. <laughs> See, he suffered for hell. He talked about that in Psalms, which was written 900 years before, whereas Daniel, what he, what he, what he or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what they experienced was hundreds of years later. So, of course, Jesus is already there. He could join them, no problem. But he can also make it where it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Flame didn't hurt them at all, didn't singe their hair, didn't, their clothes didn't even smell like fire afterwards. I've been through a fire before. I've still got notebooks from Bible college and, and stuff and papers that have the gray stuff because our, our, we had a dormitory fire one, one year. And I've still got stuff that has all the smoke stains. And sometimes you can still smell a little bit of it all these years later. But they didn't even smell like smoke when they were right in the furnace. You know how hair, you can burn, have your Barbecue, you know. Who's going to barbecue today? Who's going to cook? Anyway, you can do that, Brother Escovedo. Uh, but anyway, if you've ever done that, yeah, you know, you singe your hair. As you, well, you could, 
Singed hairs has a, a unique smell. But they didn't smell like it. Why? The Lord was with them. By the way, you can go in the, you can be like the prodigal son, and you can be wallowing in the, in the, in the pig pen of life, of worldly life. But God, if you yield to God, God can cause, bring you up out of that like he did the prodigal son, and he can even cause you to not even smell like you've been in it. It depends on you whether he does that or not. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they put their faith in the Lord, and so God did that for them. So the secret to life, folks, is trust in the Lord. Daniel's another good, good example. He got thrown in a lion's den, but guess what? The Lord was with him there too. Sent his angels, stopped the mouth of the lions. So, folks, you can't ever go anywhere, go through anything, but what God hasn't already, uh, he's not already been there. And uh, I'm not going to, preach much longer on that. I just want to leave that with you and tell you, look, walk with God. Walk with God. Trust Him. Believe His Word. And no matter what, I mean, I, I, I believe that the day's going to come. We're going to see persecution here in America. Kent Hovind's a good example. Kent Hovind's written 37 books while in prison. Why? Because God's been with him. Joseph, a good example from the Bible. Joseph was in prison, but the Bible says about Joseph more than anybody else, the Lord was with him. <laughs> he got sold into slavery by his own brothers. He got falsely accused by a woman and got jealous or he got, uh, felt jilted because she was an adulterer, wanted to be an adulteress. <clears throat> Joseph didn't want to be an adulterer. And so Joseph refused her advances day after day. And finally, he had the only way he could get away is to leave her coat in his hands because she was grabbing him. And he got out of there to keep his honor and to respect his master. And she got so angry, she falsely accused him. And he got thrown in jail because her husband believed her. He suffered a lot and for no fault of his own. But the Lord was with him. <laughs> you can't go anywhere and go through anything but what, as a child of God, the Lord is with you. I think of children so often. I watched part of a horrible, horrible video someone sent me a link to. Or it was linked in a, in a thing talking about um, just about injustices, and it was, I, I don't know, some of you may have known about this, I don't know, but it's just awful, the awfulest thing I've ever heard of in my life, I guess, and uh, how that there's this, this man, uh, English man, who married a Russian woman, they had children, and he and some of the elites in the country, and teachers, and even uh, leaders of the church were abusing these children day after day, and hundreds of them and these kids finally told somebody, and, and they made a video thing, and now those people are being prosecuted, except the people who told them about it. Uh, the mother uh, who exposed her husband uh, abuse, she's being persecuted by the government. Why? Because most government officials are guilty of those very things. See? And so sometimes they, they, they go after the whistleblowers, and it's just vile, filthy stuff going on all the time. But yet you wouldn't know it by the children. They seemed happy. Why? Because God has a way of, of insulating people's minds, especially children, where they can take a lot. That's why a lot of children, that's why God says don't spare the rod, but you better not be abusive. But even children who are abused, it's amazing how they can, they can survive. Because God enables them to block things out or, or they, they can play and, and have joy and fun and block out the pain. But I know one thing. Whatever they, children go through, the most abused children in the world, God's there too. Because God said, if anybody offend one of these little ones that believe in me, especially the ones that believe in me, if anyone offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it would be better for him that a millstone be hung about his neck and he be cast into the sea. God is, and the Bible says about children, their angels do behold my face. The angels, we all have angels that watch over us. God's uh, uh, dictated that or ordained that. But they watch and they report back to God. Not that God doesn't know. He knows everything. But, but there's a process of recording things. And let me tell you something. God, nobody, I don't care what the situation. I don't care if you're being in some country, you're a missionary, and you're, you're, you're speared to death like Jim Elliott and, and the missionaries that went to the Alka Indians years ago. 
And they didn't go anywhere, but God had already been there. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what you ever will go through, remember this. God is with you. Though you, if you lay down, if you, if you make your bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Why? He's already been there. So no matter what, just remember that. God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And what a wonderful promise that is. And uh, so, but that's for God's people. Make sure you're one of God's people. Make sure you've trusted Him as Savior because when you trust Him as Savior, He comes with the end. Colossians 3.17 says that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. When you put your faith and trust in Christ as your Savior, God comes in your heart and He dwells in your heart because of your faith. And He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And that's a promise He keeps. Well, He keeps all of His promises. That's a promise He makes. One of my favorite songs is Day by Day. And with each passing moment, Strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment. He knows about every place, situation I'm into, I'm going to get into. He allows things to come in my life or disallows them. So trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. For he whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain or pleasure. Uh, forget how it goes. Lovingly, it's part of pain or ple and pleasure. Uh, anyway, I forget how that ends. This is the message. Anyway, I, f I forget. Anyway, I did pretty good getting as far as I got. <laughs> but, uh, but I love that other verse, uh, the other verse that says, uh, let's see. Um, I think I'm going I think I know what page that's on. Pretty close. Something about this, the charge he made. Um, yeah, 107. Yeah, help me, Lord. Let's see. No, no, let's, let's see. It's the second verse, yeah. Um, the protection. Yeah, I love this. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid when he said, As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Of course, in the song, they have to make it rhyme. So. Um, so the protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. And then the quote, as thy days, thy strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. God made a promise that as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Which means no matter where you are or what you're going through, God gives you the strength you need to make it through that day. Just trust him. Just trust Him. And if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, that's the first exercise of trust you need to make. You can't save yourself. You cannot pay the wages of sin, which is an eternity in hell. But God, who is eternal, can and did. Took on the form of flesh and dipped his soul into hell. And eternity matched the eternal penalty that God required. The eternal Son of God paid the eternal pay wages of sin and thereby arose, having won the victory over sin and death and hell. And He offers to each of us His gift of eternal life. Though we don't deserve it, He offers us a gift, but He won't force it on you. You have to choose to believe in Him and put your trust in Him. Letting go of anything else you've ever trusted. you got to let go of your religion and your church, your denomination, your baptism, your whatever someone has done to you or you've done that you thought would get you into heaven. you got to let go of that. That won't do it. No beads ever paid for your sin. No waters ever paid for your sin. No church ever paid for your sin. Only Jesus paid for your sin. Put your faith and trust in Jesus alone. And He will see that faith. Count that faith as righteousness. The only thing that you can do that's full of being right. <laughs> and he'll save your soul. Come inside and dwell within your heart. And he'll never leave you 
nor forsake you. Never. What a wonderful promise. Let's live in it. Let's walk in it. Let's thank God for it. And let's serve him, serve him because of it. Father, I pray that you bless the message. And I pray that you'd help us to realize that we can never, ever, ever, as your children, once we trust you, Savior, we can never go where you've not already been. And I pray that the knowledge that you are in us and will not leave us nor forsake us ever will be brought to the forefront of our mind when we're in a situation that we want to be out of, that we know it's not right, and that we'll call on you and trust in you, plead for your mercy and ask you to lead us out and deliver us. And you certainly are able to deliver us. That's the grandest theme ever sung. Grand, grandest theme sung by mortal tongue that you are able to deliver us. Help us not forget it. May this be a blessing to somebody today. And may it be in our hearts and in our minds, ready to be brought back by your Holy Spirit when we need it, if the day comes we need that. So bless, we pray, your word to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.